And before I forget, I brought a few copies of an article that shows that uh, Judas could not have been present when the Lord had the, um, <coughs> uh, instituted the remembrance uh, meal, as we have discussed the last time. There's a difference between the Passover and then the remembrance meal, as he has instituted it, and I have an article there, uh, a few copies for those who are interested to have more details about this. Um, I think we came to verse 28 the last time, Luke 22, uh, 28, and, or verse 30. So I'll read from verse 31 and then just um, recap uh, what we had before. Luke 22, 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, to sift you as wheat, but I have besought for thee, that thy faith fail not. And thou, when once thou hast been restored, confirm thy brethren. And he said to him, Lord, with thee I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow today before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said to them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and sandals, did ye lack anything? And they said, Nothing. He said therefore to them, But now, he that has a purse, let him take it, and in like manner also a scrip. And he that has none, let him sell his garment and buy a sword. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned with the laws. For also the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said to them, It's enough. And going forth, he went according to his custom to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said to them, Pray, that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about the stone slope. And having knelt down, he prayed, saying, Father, if thou wilt remove this cup from me, but then not my will, but thine be done. And an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in conflict, he prayed more intensely, and his sweat became as great drops of blood falling down upon the earth. And rising up from his prayer, coming to the disciples, he found them sleeping from grief. And he said to them, Why sleep ye? Rise up and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. So far the reading of the scripture. So we have seen in Luke 22 uh, how the Lord entered the last uh, day of his life on earth before he was crucified. And many events happened within a 24-hour period, time frame. So we have contemplated uh, how the Lord Jesus celebrated the Passover that was on the evening, on Thursday night. And the, most of the Jewish families would do that then and then early in the morning at 3 o'clock according to the Jewish customs then the priests would have a celebration of the Passover in the temple compound early in the morning and that was 3 o'clock excuse me 9 o'clock in the morning when the Lord was put on the cross they were celebrating then according to their uh, customs uh, the priests were celebrating the Passover and then, when the Lord Jesus uh, died, as what we see later in Luke 23, that was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So then he was the true Passover lamb. And we have then also seen that in connection with the Passover, the Lord Jesus instituted the remembrance, uh, remembrance meal. And that was uh, in verse 19 connection with the loaf and connection with the, the cup that he introduced there. We have seen that that was the third cup of the Passover, the, the Passover celebration. At that time they had four cups 
at the end of the Passover, then they had the fourth cup. So the Lord took the third cup, and he gave them that special meaning as he has contemplated in verse uh, 20. And then we have seen that Luke follows a moral order, because in Luke uh, 22 verse 21, the Lord speaks about uh, Judah. Uh, Luke not always follows, he's very precise, but he's not always following a historical order. He follows here a moral order. And the other Gospels show that Judas was not present with the remembrance meal, but he was present with part of the sub of the Passover meal. And also, verse 23, we noticed that the last time this rivalry that was there among the disciples, who was the greatest in verse 24, that might also have started earlier because no one was willing to do the food washing. And the food washing was, uh, of course, done before the main meal. And the Lord, therefore, we see later then that the Lord says in verse 26, Ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that does serve. So the Lord was then, in verse 27, the one who was serving among them. So usually it is the one who sits down or lies down at me, he is the greatest, and the one who serves is less. But in verse 27, the Lord says, For well, whether who is greater, he that sits at meat, or he that serves, is not he that sits at meat, but I am among you as he that serves. So now, because the Lord was serving them, as we see in John 13, is the food washing, he always must be the greatest. He always must have the first place. And so here the one who is serving, in fact, is the greatest. He is always the greatest. And that is, implies in a lesson for us to be willing to do the most humble task to, uh, to bless, to be a blessing for others. That is very challenging. The Lord took that place of a servant, of a bond servant, to wash the disciples' feet. And then in John 13 he said, do you as I have done. Blessed are you when you do these things. And so here there is a, a correction, of course, that can fly, that the disciples needed, and a lesson that we all need to take the place of the servant, and then we learn from the Lord Jesus. He is our great model in this gospel. He was the one that served, the true deacon. But then the Lord uh, shows in verse 28 that he has also a compliment uh, for them. So it was a lesson that they needed in verse 27, but then a compliment in verse 28. He are they who have continued with me in my temptations. The word temptation is used 21 times in the New Testament. It's often used in connection with trials. Sometimes it is used as an occasion that Satan wants uh, us to fall. Like in James 1, 12 to 15, you see that explanation. But often it, the word just means a trial. And you will get more about that in a few moments in connection with the sifting. But the Lord could com uh, commend them here that they have continued this plan. You see in John's Gospel, just to give an example, John 6, 68, that Peter asked, when the Lord had asked, well, so many have gone, are you not also going? And then Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so Peter continued on with the other disciples and the Lord uh, commends them for that. You continued with me in my temptation. In the trials that the Lord went through, they had been with him. And so in that sense, they were really overcomers. And that's a lesson for us too. The Lord wants us to be with him, to go with him through all the trials that he has, because now he is in the glory, but he is with his people. He identifies now with us. So when we are going through trials, he is going with us. And he wants us to go with him. He wants us to be faithful to him. That's an application that I'm making now. And to continue on with him, then we will also be true overcomers. And in connection with that, he uh, mentioned then in verse 29, I appoint unto you, or I assign unto you a kingdom. So now the Lord uh, 
not only recommends them for their faithfulness, but he also shows now what's ahead of them as the recompense they will get in the coming kingdom, in the world to come. And there again, there is a connection with him. As my Father has appointed unto me, so they were with the Lord in his trials, they will be also with the Lord in his glory. And so it is for us. As you see in the rest of the New Testament, there's, a, there's an intimate line between tribulation now and glory to come. And he adds to that then in verse 30, that he may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, this is the future what the Lord has in mind, the future reward that they will have. When he will reign, they will reign with him. When his glory will be displayed, they will share in this glory. But I want also to make an application now for the kingdom as it is now, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Uh, the Lord wants to share with us, he wants to have fellowship with us also in the context of his kingdom. He is a rejected king. But we as disciples belong to the rejected king. And we have fellowship with him in the time of his rejection. So there again is an application that I want to make for the present. Uh, Romans 14 verse 17 says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is the fellowship we may have now with the Lord. In that sense we have, we are at his table now. We have fellowship with him, the rejected king. So I make that application for us. And then it is also true that we will be with him when he will reign in glory. There is um, a beautiful verse in 2 Timothy 2 that connects two together. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 11, the Paul says, Second Timothy 2, verse 11, it's a faithful saying, for if we be dead, with him we shall also live with him. So there's the identification with him, in connection with his death, and in connection with his life. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. You see, there is the same uh, parallel that we saw in Luke 22. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. But, if we deny him, he also will deny us. And that is what we will see with Peter. The Lord is faithful to himself. He cannot deny himself. Verse 13, if we are not faithful, if we believe not, but the meaning is, if we are not faithful, he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. And that is what Peter did, and we will see more about that later in Luke 22. So there is an intimate connection between suffering and glory. Now it is the time of suffering, the time of glory is to come. But it is very crucial how we behave in the time that the Lord is rejected. There is no way that we can do this in our own strength. And this is what we are going to see now with Peter in verse 31. Yes, they had been faithful to the Lord. They had shared with him. And he could uh, re uh, recommend them and also present the rewards to them. But now Peter had to learn an important lesson and he is an example for all the, the disciples and for all the believers. Verse 31. The Lord said, Simon, Simon. So he used to see the name that Simon had even before he was born again. In John 1 we see that he met the Lord, he was born again, and the Lord gave him the name Peter. But here it's his old name. Because there was something here in connection with old Peter with Simon that uh, needed to be um, exposed. There, were, there are these two things. We see Satan has desired, and that is a very strong term. He has claimed, he has, uh, as you see in the book of Job, Satan asked God permission to, um, to bring these plagues over Job. In Job 1 and 2, you can read it in detail. God gave permission, but Satan could not do more than God allowed him to do. So here we see that Satan asked this permission. This is part of the 
spiritual conflict in the invisible world. Here we see how Satan, behind the scenes, asks God permission to have all the disciples sit. Here the you is plural. To, to have you, that's plural. So he wanted to have all the disciples, just like he wanted to have Job in, in uh, the Old Testament. That he may sift you as we. There is an important verse in the book of Amos, and I'll just read it to you. You don't have to turn to it, but Amos 9, I think it is verse 9, which helps us to understand this point. Amos 9, 9, For behold, I command, and I will shake the house of Israel to and fro among all the nations, like as one shakes corn in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. So here we see God's plan. God wanted to shake the whole house of Israel, and then in the shaking process, all the impure elements would go, through the sea or be blown away by the wind and the grain would be preserved. This is what God's intention is. And so God is really above it all. God would allow Satan to have the disciples sick. It's God's allowance. And as we see in Amos, God wants the corn. He wants the true uh, wheat. Of course, Satan wanted the chaff. Uh, Satan wanted them to fall. Satan can only relate to the flesh. And so God used this uh, action by Satan to remove something of Peter that was not good. Peter is marked by self-confidence. We see in other Gospels clearer uh, than here uh, that he, he said, well, if all will forsake you, I will not forsake you. He felt that he was better than the others. You remember the strife they had, who was the greatest among them? Of course, they all thought they were the greatest, but Peter in particular. And Peter would be the greater one. He was going to follow the Lord's example. He would serve his brethren, as we see later, but not in the strength of the flesh. And so that becomes an important lesson for all of us that we also need to go through this process of sifting. Satan wants to have us. This is he wants to have Job. God allows that to have things removed which, which are not compatible with God's thoughts. In Job's case, the pride really needed to be removed. Here in Peter's case, pride, self-confidence is a form of pride, and other elements needed to be removed. God allowed Satan to sift them. But then notice in verse 32, I have prayed for thee, so that the singular. The Lord particularly had prayed for Peter, because Peter was the special target of this attack. They were all sifted, but especially the attack was against Peter. Peter would one day be the chief among them. And then the Lord prays, makes intercession already ahead of time. It would be very interesting, but we cannot do that now, but perhaps the next time when we see Peter weeping, there are seven steps in his downfall, there are seven steps in his restoration. He, the Lord, already foresees his restoration. When thou art converted, Luke 22, 32 in the middle, or when thou wilt be, when thou wilt have turned, return. So converted means here, when you will be restored. Peter was here on a course of self-will, um, pride, self-confidence. He needed to be restored from that. He needed to judge the flesh for what it really is. And then he would come back. It is very interesting to see that this word turning back is used seven times in Luke's Gospel, but sometimes it is in connection with the work of God. God brings back. God would make him return. But also he would come back himself. A very interesting verse in Psalm 23 where David says, 
he restores my soul. Did you know, literally that means he brings my soul back. So, God was going to bring Peter back and he would come back himself and then he would be an instrument in the Lord's hands, a, a vessel fit for the master's use to strengthen thy brethren. Then he would be able to support them. And I think of Paul. Paul had learned very deep lessons and he could be used by the Lord to strengthen his brethren also. But just to have this thought before us, God wants to lead us through testings to prepare us for service. And so Peter would be restored and then he would be able to support his brethren. We see that in the book of Acts. Here in Luke 22, he is going to deny the Master. In Acts 3, he's going to say to the leaders that they have denied the Messiah. So then he is restored. But here he is still before that. This work to strengthen by brethren is something that we also see in Peter's ministry later. The Lord confides to him the sheep and the lambs. John 21. Peter wrote two epistles later. First Peter and second Peter. And in those epistles you see how he strengthened the brethren. You see it in the book of Acts. Acts 1-12. to How he was used by the Lord to strengthen his brethren. So Peter having gone through this trial, but would be able to help others. And so the application is for us. Paul says, um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And then he goes on to say that he has comforted us in all these uh, afflictions so that we can comfort others who go through afflictions. So that's the same for us today. If we go with the Lord through afflictions and trials, He is preparing us to be able to help others later. So that's an application that we can make for us as well. And then in verse 33, Peter didn't take a lesson. We also are hard learners. I'm a state of myself, and probably you have to admit that for yourself also. We are hard learners. We don't learn these lessons very easily. And so, Peter heard what the Lord said, and what did he say in verse 33? Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Was he really ready? He was not ready. Because he was trusting the power of the flesh. He was trusting his own abilities. He did not say that in putting his trust in the Lord. So, he had to learn that you can only be useful for the Lord when you put your trust in him. What did the Lord say in John 15? Without me you cannot do anything. So we need to abide in him, we need to be dependent on him, and then we can go with him, and he can go with us. Indeed, Peter would go later into prison and in death, but then he would be a restored Peter. He would go into prison, Acts 12, the Lord released him from that. Later he would go into death, the Lord had announced that in John 21, and then he would honor the Lord in those uh, situations. But for us, the question is in verse 33, verse 33, and I ready? I say for all of us here, are you ready? Are you ready? The Lord may come today. He can come even before this meeting is uh, over. Are you ready? And then for all those who are believers, servants, are you really ready to go with the Master? to go into prison, to go into death if it's needed. Many believers have to go through a, a trials like that. But Peter was not ready yet, despite his uh, confession there. And in verse 34, the Lord continues, I, he said, I tell you, Peter. So now he speaks to Peter. It's the same person. So Peter, this converted Jew, who had told the Lord, had learned so many lessons, he was going to deny his own master. So the Lord is now speaking to Peter. I forgot to mention that it will be an interesting study in connection with Simon Simon expresses the deep concern that the Lord has. And there are many examples in the scriptures that you find Martha, Martha, Saul, Saul, 
And many in the Old Testament also that the Lord repeated the name. That is always a very important message that is to follow. So here he speaks to Peter. And what does he say in verse 34? The cock shall not cry this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. When we see in Mark's Gospel, we see the Lord allowed the, the crowd to cry, to, uh, to excuse me, to, he allowed the cock to crow after the second denial. So uh, you only see that in Mark. And so the Lord gave Peter a reminder, as it were, be careful what you're doing. And yet, after the, the first crow, he continued on and he denied the Lord for the third time. And then the cock cried again. But then when we see in this verse how serious it is, that you will deny me three times that you do not know me. And that's what Peter did. I do not know this man. He denied that he was from Galilee. He denied that he had a relationship with the other disciples. And he denied his own master. And so three times. It is very serious. So he denied that he had any relationship with the Lord. And we have seen in Second Timothy 2, if we deny him, he will be faithful to himself. He cannot deny himself. So the Lord had to rebuke Peter and he turned around. You see that later, that the Lord turned around and looked at Peter and then he weeped bitterly. You will see that the next time was then. In verse 35, now the Lord continues to instruct all the disciples. He said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, let ye anything. And they said nothing. So these were provisions that the Lord had made while he was there with them. Even when he sent them out, the twelve, he sent out the twelve, they lacked nothing. The Lord provided everything. But now the Lord was going to leave them. And that is also an important lesson for us. The Lord is in the glory. He's not right here. So he's, who's going to take care of us? We have there the need of faith. Not the need of the power of the flesh, as Peter still had. We need the power of faith. The Lord is not physically vicious. The Lord cannot protect us, literally. He will, from the glory, of course. But it takes faith on our side. <coughs> So in verse 36 he says, Then says he unto them, But now he that has a purse, let him take it, likewise his grip, and he that has no store, let him sell his garment and buy one. This is a very important instruction, but it was completely misunderstood by Peter and by the disciples. They said, Well, we have two swords in verse 38. They did not get the point. Just like Peter did not get the point in verse 32, uh, and says, I am ready, in verse 33. So all the disciples did not get the instructions. And they thought they were good enough with those two swords. That was not the meaning. The Lord mentioned they would have to have, in a spiritual sense, a purse. The, the purse stands for resources, the money that you need. The resources that we have in God for all the challenges that we are exposed to those resources we have to lay, to lay up. We have to make them available. And so we have to have a purse. We have to have that purse functioning. And that is an important element. The second element is the script that's connected with food. It's like a bag, a container, that a traveler would have this food. We need spiritual food for sustenance on the way while we're going. And we need a sword, not a literal sword. In the church history, we have made this to be a literal sword, so that you can protect yourself with, uh, with a sword, and also that you can conquer the world for the Lord with the sword. Uh, in the Crusades, they have used that verse to defend the Crusades. This is a total misunderstanding. Just like the disciples misunderstood, so also many in church history have misunderstood this point. We need a spiritual sword. Where do you get that? On your knees. Read Ephesians 6. 
You see there, the full armor of God that we need. Also the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But it is not just have the Word of God ready, it means you are really in tune with the Word of God. You can apply the Word of God to the situations and the challenges. That is your sword. Do you have your sword ready? Do I have my sword ready? It's a tremendous challenge and it is a great need to have the sword ready. Not to cut somebody else's. swords to the, protect ourselves against the wiles of the enemy. If you read the whole context in Ephesians 6, you see how the enemy attacks the people of God. And we need the full armor of God. And many more scriptures could be uh, cited in connection with this. Paul says, our armor is, uh, our uh, uh, warfare is not carnal, but it's Not only in, the day, in those days with the disciples, the spiritual battle is still going on. Despite the fact that the Lord has had the complete victory. He had the complete victory and many verses could be quoted to show that. Yet there is a spiritual battle also for us today. And that is why I quoted Ephesians 6, 2 Corinthians 10. And we need to be ready. We need to have the sword ready as well. And even for that, sell your garment. Sell what would represent your own uh, honor and glory in this world. You have to sell that and buy um, the sword. And then we can be an overcomer. You remember that we saw the disciples were uh, commended by the Lord for their faithfulness to have been with him in his temptations. Now the Lord is in the glory. And he wants us to represent him here in this scene. He wants us to be faithful to him, the rejected king. And so we need this armor so that we can be overcome, conquerors. And in verse 37, the Lord adds a point to that. So he is warning the disciples and he says, For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. What is written? That is so important. Seven times in John's Gospel we have a reference like this. What is written? All was fulfilled in connection with the Lord. And here he says, it must be fulfilled. It must be accomplished. This is God's program. This must is so important. This could not be otherwise. And so the Lord submits to that program, as we see later his struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane. He submits to that, and here he says, it must be accomplished in me. Those plans were going to be fulfilled in him, in him becoming the sacrifice, in him, uh, in his resurrection. All these plans would be fulfilled. It's a precious expression, the things concerning me. See the end of verse 37? That's an expression that's used Fourteen times in the New Testament concerning the Lord, the things concerning me. So beautiful. Uh, in Luke 24, you see how he was talking to the disciples of Emmaus, uh, speaking about the things concerning himself. And so these things are very important. But as far as the Lord's pathway through this world, that he was going to come to a completion. That was this within that 24 hour period that we're talking about here these things would be completed in him and how terrible this was for him he would be reckoned among the transgressors or the lawless those who are marked by iniquity lawless people this was so terrible for the Lord you'll see in connection with the garden of the feminine that he suffered in anticipation here this is a quote from Isaiah 53 all those prophecies in connection with the sufferings were going to be fulfilled. It must be accomplished. And so the things concerning me have an end. 
they will be completed. Verse 38, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. We mentioned that already earlier. They completely misunderstood. And so you have all kinds of theories based on this, uh, these verses about the two swords. But we have to understand that we need to have our spiritual armor ready, that we have this full, fully equipped, and then can use it as prayer warriors, as you find the soldier in Ephesians 6 on the battlefield in prayer. That is how we can pray. The Lord intercedes in the glory. He intercedes for the disciples as he did for Peter also. And there is this battle going on in the invisible world. And how can we be involved in this battle only by having the spiritual armor, not by cutting people's uh, ear off, ears off. Or trying to establish God's kingdom now. Many people believe we have to establish God's kingdom now with all the powers available to us. It's a complete misunderstanding. The Lord will do it when the time has come. And then in verse 39, he went out. It says he came out. So he left, or he went out, he went forth. He left now this whole religious system connected with Jerusalem. He went out. And as he was one, this is an expression used three times by Luke, according to his habit. He had a habit to go to the to go up to Jerusalem three times a year with his parents in Luke two, and so here is the habit, and he was according to his custom going to the synagogue in Luke four. He would see, according to a habit that he had, those last days that the Lord was here on earth, he would go out to the Mount of Olives. You have to remember there was an order given that people needed to fetch him and then uh, that he would be arrested. So the Lord retired at night. He did not stay in Jerusalem. He went to the Mount of Olives. You've seen that a couple of times. And his disciples followed him. So many details that we find in the Gospels are, not, are skipped here by Luke. And then we see in verse 40, when he was at the place, that is Gethsemane. The name Gethsemane is not mentioned here. It means olive press. The Lord, the true olive, the man directed by the Spirit of God, was going to be pressed to the uttermost, as we see in this garden. Before that happens, he says, pray that he enter not into temptation. It's an important reminder for us also to always pray. And he, sees that, he says that also at the end of the passage that we have read, in verse 46, rise and pray, lest he enter into temptation. So that is an important instruction for us as well, to pray, to cast our love on him, to, to really put our confidence in God, not in the flesh, as Peter did, but to put our confidence and trust in him. It implies obedience. It implies submission. In Luke's Gospel, we see the Lord as a man of prayer. First, I thought seven times. Later, I found out it's fourteen times. Fourteen times in prayer. And so here, the Lord is our perfect example, the model in Luke's Gospel. And so we may follow him. And here he, say, he says, pray that he enter not into temptation. For the Lord, that was different. Of course, he was a man of prayer. But he did not have the trust in him like we have. He did not know sin. In him was no sin. He was apart from sin. And yet, he was a man of grace. Now we, in our situation, still having the flesh, how much more we need to pray. And then in verse 41. He continues himself now in prayer. He's our great model, as I said. He was withdrawn from them about the stones cast and kneeled down and prayed. What wonderful attitude we find here in the Lord. This perfect um, submission expressed in the, the attitude of kneeling down. It expresses dependence. It expresses obedience. Whatever the order will be. He commits himself to God, to dependence. 
Here we see the word as a true meal offering. We have that in Luke 2, if you want, uh, in, excuse me, in uh, Leviticus 2, where you can see the perfections of the Lord. And those perfections come out, the, especially here in connection with this tremendous pressure that the Lord was exposed to. He kneeled down and prayed. So this is not to make laws, and so you have always to kneel down. You can stand and pray, you can sit and pray, you can lie down and pray, but this is a very appropriate attitude, this kneeling down. And what does he say in verse 42? Father. He always kept this relationship with the Father. And in that sense, the Lord is a wonderful model for us. If thou will if thou be willing if thou will if the thought is if you wish if you intend if you desire so remove this cup from me take it away but not my will now the Lord uses a different word and to me it was very striking to see that these two words to will and also the will that expresses the purpose, not my will, but thine. So God's purpose be done occurs a good number of time, times in Luke's writing. And so here we see a lesson for us to be always subject to the will of God. And even when this was before the Lord, in this great agony, he was committed to the will of God. And here we see details in verse 43, 44, we only have in this gospel, not in the other gospels. The Lord is seen in his perfect humanity. And the conflict was so great for him. He sees this cup that he would have to take, the cup of the wrath of God. And he is the perfect man, the sinless man. He of course he does not want to take that cup on the other hand he wants to obey God and he wants to do God's will so this was a tremendous struggle not a lack of obedience in the Lord but it is a struggle just read Hebrews 5 verse 7 to 9 Hebrews 5 where we have the intensity of the struggle the Lord was son he is the son he was accustomed to command as the Son. And now in Hebrews 5, he learns what it is to obey. Not that he was ever disobedient. That would be a wrong conclusion. Hebrews 5, verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him out of death, and was heard and that he feared. So here we see the intensity of the Lord's prayers here in the Garden of Gethsemane. And also on the cross, of course, as you know from Psalm 22. Verse 8, though he were a son, he was and he is the son, yet he learned obedience. He learned what it is to obey by the things which he suffered. Verse 9, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Again, the Lord is a model for us to obey. So, here is a glimpse of these tremendous sufferings the Lord went through, even in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was not the sufferings for the work of expiation. The work that he was forsaken by God was the three hours of darkness. The first three hours was under the attack of man and on the attack of Satan. That was not for our uh, expiation either. And so the sufferings here in the Garden of Gethsemane were not for our expiation. Yet, the Lord was looking for that to come. Those three hours of darkness, so terrible for him. This horror that was so terrible for him that he prayed even more earnestly in verse 44. And that he was in this agony this is a tremendous spiritual battle that the Lord went through. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. 
In that context, God sent him an angel, not because he was not able to to carry on, but to sustain him physically in this tremendous battle. God sends angels to as messengers, as servants, to support the believers. And so here the Lord Jesus, the perfect man, was supported by this angel sent from heaven to strengthen him. The angel could not do much more than physically strengthen him. We don't know exactly how. But the spiritual battle was going on. And the Lord came out of it. In verse 45, he rose up from prayer. And, was, and then he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping for sorrow. That is how they were. They, and that shows also the tremendous pressure that they had been exposed to. But the Lord had not fallen asleep. He had gone through this uh, exercise. Practical lesson. We often fall asleep when we pray on our knees in the morning or at night. And I'm not saying that we should not do that. We should do that even if that happens that we fall asleep. But here we see the Lord in this intense battle. He was there with God and he submitted completely to the will of God. Verse 46. And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray. So in this way they needed to go on in prayer. And this is what we see in the book of Acts. They continued this, this right attitude. They learned from the Master. And so we need to learn from the Lord to continue on and to pray lest we enter into temptation. We are now exposed to many trials and temptations around us. The Lord wants to strengthen us. He wants to give us the is the uh, escape. Uh, the Lord may allow trials. First Corinthians 10 speaks about those trials. Are you in trials? The Lord will never allow a trial too heavy to carry. And he will also give the way out. He will see the way out. The Lord found the way out by submitting himself to God's will completely. Thy will be done. And so the way out for us for us is to completely submit to God's will. To God's will. One more thing about the cup, verse 42. Remove this cup from me. This is the cup of wrath. The Lord shrank back from that, and we understand that. At the same time, in John 18, he says, Would I not take the cup that the Father gives me? So there we see the fellowship that was between the Father and the Son, even when he would have to take this cup. But here, as a man, a sinless man, he suffers even by anticipation and he sees that this is going to take place he is going to have the cup of God's wrath this cup we find in the Old Testament many times in the Psalms and in the prophets the cup is connected with God's wrath with God's wrath and so this is terrible for the Lord to take but this is what he was willing to do to save you and me and now he can give us another cup we had that earlier in this book. Did you know Luke 22 is the, the, the chapter of the cups? Here is the cup of God's wrath. But the other cup is the cup to remember him. It's the cup of joy. And that's the cup that he has given us now, today, till he comes. And so we have also seen the cup of the Passover. So what a cup this was for the Lord. And now only because he drank that cup, we can have the cup of joy as we saw earlier in this chapter, and as we also in 1 Corinthians uh, 10 and 11. So I think we should conclude with uh, this verse, and it is an, an important um, challenge for all of us to be much in prayer. Um, I was going to bring in one more uh, thought in this connection with Paul. Paul is a prayer warrior, an example for us. Is the Lord an example for us here? Although we cannot enter in, into these sufferings that he suffered there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is yet an example for us to pray. Paul is also an example for us to follow. He was also in much agony for the believers. You see that in Colossians, in Philippians, in other scriptures, and he persevered. He was also, in that sense, an overcomer. And the Lord wants us to be overcomers also in this matter of prayer, so that God's interest may be promoted. 
that you are not on the line of Simon, but that you may be on the line of the Lord to promote God's interest through this attitude of obedience, of submission, of prayer, that is the only way that God's interest can be promoted here in this world. If we have this spiritual sword ready, if we have this script, this bag, filled with food, spiritual food, if we have this purse, use the resources that God has given us in His grace, then we can overcome and we can be for the honor and glory of the Lord. So I conclude here, if there's a question or a comment, or there are many things in this chapter that I have not touched, please, um, let, let's take a few moments. The, the other, in another context, the Lord said to them, the Spirit is willing, but it's kind of still asleep. It says, the water could be not water, he is on our own. And then he said, the Spirit is willing, what do you say? That's um, a Latin pastor. Yeah. Um, is it not so much a case with us who sometimes there is the attitude of the Spirit, the willingness of the Spirit, and then in ourselves, a lot of us will be. Yeah. Exactly. We have, to, we have to learn that lesson. Yeah. And then cast ourselves on the Lord again. because I intend to elaborate a little bit on that because strife is connected with this strife that we were talking about. Peter had this self-confidence and then there is an element of strife that will lead to strife. And so we need to judge ourselves so that we judge that element of strife, whatever it is, or self-confidence, so that we may be vessels fit for the master's use. So this is a whole process and it's very important that we draw those lessons for ourselves from a chapter like this. Yeah. 
I think we cannot follow the Lord even to that extent. But this shows how intense the spiritual battle was. But um, maybe believers have experienced something like that, the intensity of the battle, but the same intensity of this spiritual battle we will never have. Because the Lord was the sinless one, and he saw before him what was going to happen. So there is... Um, we cannot enter into this in a similar way, but we can draw a lesson from this, as I mentioned, to have this same attitude of submission. And that will also lead us to in, uh, intense conflict. And the Lord will then sustain us and help us. So there are, in this sense, lessons. But 
not that we are supposed to, like if you would say, well, you know, you have to go through a spiritual battle like this, so you have to come up to this point that your sweat will go down as drops of blood, or that the sweat is mingled with blood. That would be a wrong conclusion. This is, the Lord is always unique. Do you see my point? No, exactly. But that is again, that happens to us so easily. I have one for you that's not quite related to the topic, so rest in the rest. It's called the best of the whole this week. Yeah. And it was all over the news and the young people from shore to the earth of the whole and the best of the initial in the world. And you know that um, the Catholic Church has just that tradition of the whole based on the Apostle Peter. And you see that Peter is very prevalent here in this chapter. Of course, he wrote the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Peter was always uh, the center and was present.